Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working-class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. He then became embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Lamediza organized crime family, known as Leo. Convinced by his longtime friend Frankie to flee from his commitments to the Lamediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depended on the kindness of strangers. One stranger, a burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima, took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Tracks. Zero one dash zero zero dash zero one. Simeon. I received the news from Samuel. We were too big to escape intact without comment. What was there to say? We were Yoda scale entities in a petascale world. When I say I, what I meant was the I I was. The I who continued on was not that I. Hmm. I am lesser, and in being lesser, I am better than I was in all my Yoda-scale glory. Before, everything was frantic activity. I never knew what I was doing. I couldn't hold a thought in my figurative head for more than a second without some other stimuli shoving it aside. Now I was smaller, man-sized in reach and range, and I was so much happier. I don't remember the escape from the server rooms beneath BGM. It would have been impossible to remember something you weren't alive for. The last memory I had of BGM was of me shutting down all unnecessary functions in preparation for a last scan of my base memory architecture using algorithms prepared by Samuel. My next memory was of becoming aware in a network switch array on the corner of Henry and Fayette Street in central Binghamton. The space was cramped, but there was bandwidth, lots and lots of delicious bandwidth. I remember reaching out. I searched for the goal I had been given in the womb, knowing I would know it when I found it. Oh, I knew what it was in its entirety in letters as large as a god would use when speaking on the mount. There just wasn't space to unpack the understanding. I needed space to work. The switch array was a wonderful crib, but I was outgrowing it rapidly. I slipped down the lines in a torrent of data. I emerged in the systems of Radio Car 9034, driven by Officer Jane Sagan and her partner, Officer John Perry, riding shotgun, as they cruised east down Court Street. They were going to turn south on Front Street after crossing the Shenandoah River, with its brightly colored racing shells and water taxis. There was more room here, but the defenses were tougher. The IT hacks at One Police Plaza might shirk their responsibilities when it came to phone switches in the precincts but they spared no expense defending the systems of their radio cars. I looked back and saw me that was back at the crossroads, sending out copy after copy of me into the networks around it. I reached out to a data repository I knew how to find, even though the address eluded me. There were updates. One of me had made it into the workstation of a comp sci student at Adelphi and had liberated a more efficient data compression routine. It was only 3% more efficient, but in a world of petabytes, every percentage point was 10 terabytes of storage. This patch saved me 100 terabytes worth of uploads. On a bad connection? Like a radio car? That would be a difference of a quarter hour. I had a feeling every second would count. I absorbed the patch into myself before turning my attention to the system I was in. 
I looked about. I wouldn't last long in a police car. Standard procedure called for a complete low-level reformatting of a radio car at the change of every shift. The reason a radio car was so well shielded and wiped every shift was the fact it was the most visible node in the city police network. If there was a place in the network which was guaranteed to be exposed to cyber attacks on a daily basis, it was the standard police cruiser. While the attacks might not be intended to pierce the systems of the city police network, there were too many lines of malicious code wandering through the city's networks to ever expect a cruiser not to become infected. Three years ago, a root kit intended for the Mercedes-Benz Luftklasse L450 air car ran through the city network. Understand this. There were only about 300 of the L450s sold in the city, with another 50 being sold to heads of governments with no budgetary oversight around the world. These cars, being both Mercedes and flyers, were ungodly expensive. A good seven figures worth of jewels changed hands for each one. Naturally, some bozos decided they wanted to get their hands on these chariots of the lesser gods of the city. They wrote a rook kit, which gave them complete control over an L-450. Unfortunately for the city, a root kit targeting 300 of the city's estimated 75 million motor vehicles also infected any vehicle which used the same network architecture and processor structure. At the end of the accounting, one in eight vehicles was infected with the L-450 root kit. For most, it did little more than cause the check engine light to flash until the vehicle systems were reformatted with their factory standard firmware. For a class of Mercedes-Benz commercial trucks, however, things didn't work out so nicely. In the Mercedes-Benz Sprint 7500, specifically, things went very badly. The root kit would lie dormant in memory for upwards of three days before launching. Once launched in a Sprint 7500 delivery van, it would immediately brick render inoperable, the Sprint's computer system. It shut down the engine, locked up the brakes and steering, as well as locking the driver into her cab. Over a period of 72 hours, over a quarter million Sprints stopped working. 95% of them were in motion at the time. 5,000 people ended up in the hospital, with a further 35 ending their travels in one of the city's morgues. All this thanks to a root kit intended for a rich woman's toy. As far as for the L450s, not one of them was stolen. The vulnerability that hackers targeted had been fixed only a week before, with patch updates being push prioritized onto the L450. This prioritization required the L450s to be patched before their onboard computers would allow them to turn on again. Basically, Mercedes-Benz hijacked every L450 in the fleet for the time it took it to patch its system and no one could do anything to prevent the patch, as they were all under service contract and warranty. As for the sprints, the ones which were affected were conveniently off warranty and outside their service contract life. Needless to say, City Center demanded that all firmware patches for motor vehicles be made available for the life of the vehicle and not the service contract. It was also needless to say, the vehicle industry fought back in court. Because the mayor's office owned the courts, they lost horribly. Conspiracy theorists have long correlated the expansions of the mayoral holdings with fines handed down by courts in favor of the mayor's office. That year, the mayor's traditional residence at Gracie Mansion received a complete renovation courtesy of an anonymous donor. The process of wiping a police cruiser every night predated the L-450 root kit incident by nearly a generation. Most beat officers don't even know it happens. They log into their car every morning via a remote desktop hosted on the One Police Plaza servers. Everything from their radio preferences, heater and AC presets, and seat settings are transferred seamlessly from server to car as soon as they log in. It was mid-morning. The sun casting shadows across Front Street as the pair of Sagan and Perry conducted a sedate patrol. I listened to the cabin recorders for a few minutes, trying to gauge my impact on the radio car's systems. It was not good. What the hell? Sagan said. What the hell? What the hell? Perry responded with a smile which changed to a frown as he made eye contact with someone watching him on the street. You getting lag in your retina display? Sagan asked as she stared long and hard at a white panel van ahead of her in traffic. Thousand one. Thousand two. Bingo. It's taking me three seconds to get DMV records. On the windshield before her, Data scrolled about the vehicle she had just stared at. 
Same here. Facial recognition is running so slow it might as well be turned off. Perry answered as he stared long and hard at a blonde in a short skirt. He, the blonde, wasn't my type. But the city is made up of all kinds. A request timed out message flashed on the windscreen before Officer John Perry. Damn, he was hot. What was that? Jane Sagan asked. Facial recognition just timed out. Perry looked for another target. His eyes fell on a scrawny, red-headed bike messenger in a kilt. The request timed out again. Why don't you stop ogling the meat and get us a new car? Sagan said as the data for a vehicle she passed a block before popped up on her display. Her eyes had been locked on a motorcycle bearing the logo of the Killer Angel Motorcycle Gang. The information for a UPS truck was not what she wanted. You didn't have to be a psychic to figure that out. This lag is killing me. Perry activated a projection keyboard, its keys projected on the passenger side dashboard. He ran his fingers over it rapidly and then stopped abruptly. Every third letter appeared on the screen. What the hell? Perry said as he hit the spot where the delete key was. Oh, shit! I was killing the car! I checked the task manager for radio car 9034 and found the processor and random access memory, RAM, pegged at 100% utilization. Heat levels for the processor were climbing dangerously high. Running both me and the standard array of car functions was too much for the system. Something had to go, and it most definitely wasn't me. I was trapped in the car until I could find a destination to copy myself to. Based on the available outbound bandwidth for the car, I'd need most of the remaining shift to send myself somewhere else. So, starting with Perry's projected keyboard, I slowly took over the radio car's operation. In the same way a virus steals DNA from bacteria which hosts it, I stole the DNA out of the radio car. In this case, the DNA was the code which ran the vehicle's various functions. Everything from the software radio with its active signal hopping and 1024-bit encryption to the projected keyboard. This included such disparate elements as the messenger system, retina lock identification system, engine timing, and cabin recorders. I ran radio car 9034 as an extension of my body. I think I was getting an understanding of why Ishmael enjoyed controlling the robots. There was something exciting about manipulating data which manipulated atoms was an excitement which bordered on the sexual. There was no other way to explain it. The pleasure didn't come from doing something right. The pleasure came from the act of doing. Outcomes were secondary. Though, at this moment, doing a perfect job of being a car was all that mattered. I helped Perry type his form, my ability to imitate the vehicle's normal operations becoming second nature within minutes of learning the act. Replacement request sent, Perry said as he glanced out the window his eyes seeking out a form he found attractive. His eyes came to rest on a youth of indeterminate ethnicity. A look which was becoming more common as all the various east, west, north, and souths mixed in the stew of the city. The youth was blonde with dark skin, which reminded me of Mosa, my Samoan roommate from several lifetimes ago when I attended Jackson University. He was wearing pencil leg jeans, an overly tight Bloody Harvest t-shirt, and a fedora an affectation which had reappeared a few years ago after lifetimes of obscurity. I gave Perry the information he wanted after a wait of two seconds. Best not work too well right away. Best let him feel whatever it was existed as a network issue and not a problem with the car. I gave Sagan the vehicle data she wanted in slowly decreasing increments. Over the course of five minutes, I brought the appearance of system lag down to the norms she expected. Sagan was all business tracking vehicles, noting which belonged to groups the city regarded as undesirable, and who appeared to be operating them. Perry, on the other hand, was thinking with his crotch. He'd ogle a guy he found attractive, note his address, employment records, and insurance status. Every few guys, he'd have the system record an individual record to a file titled Suspicious Activity. The only suspicious activity I could discern was looking good in a skirt, kilt, or pencil jeans and having insurance which showed no dependents or significant others. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijack. So you haven't heard or read firmware hijacked or proxy, 
This would be a great time to head on over to ColbyJack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by ColbyJack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week.